we were to join the Americans, we were Task Force 57, and our job, this was on the Okinawa landings, as it were, when uh, that was being assaulted by uh, American troops. Just south of Okinawa were three islands, the Sakashimas, uh, which were the housing, the kamikaze pilots and their aircraft and so on. Nimitz wanted those three obliterated every day. Runways bombed, holes and shelled, and installations destroyed, planes shot up on the ground, as much damage as we could do, stop them from uh, uh, fighting the Americans who were assaulting Okinawa itself. Yes, we're at Formosa and a string of islands, and these were um, staging islands between Formosa and the main three main Japanese islands. We tried to prevent aircraft being moved between Formosa and Japan because the Americans were concentrating on Japan and trying to destroy the air fleets there. And we had that job to do for several weeks. It was difficult because our chaps went off they bombed these airfields on these islands and made a good job of it. But the following day, uh, they were in operation again because the islands themselves were made of coral. And the holes that were made were made in coral. And the holes that were filled were filled with coral, you know, within 24 hours. And so it was a thankless task because we lost quite a lot of men doing it and it had very, very temporary results. But having said that, it, uh, it was a job that uh, we had to do, and uh, we did it well, and then we were shifted further up north uh, till we um, were off Japan itself. And we became under Admiral Horses' command uh, with um, Admiral Vian in tactical control of us, Rawlings in command of the British Pacific Fleet, and um, operating under the overall American command. And our task in the Pacific was to interdict uh, aircraft, Japanese aircraft, flying up from Formosa uh, to Okinawa when the Americans were attacking Okinawa and intervening in the Okinawa operation, to do which they had to land at the Sakashima Gunto. So we were, in fact, concentrating our attacks on the Sakashima Gunto, both to destroy aircraft on the ground and to make the runways unusable. <coughs> and we were doing that uh, through sort of uh, March, right through to May, I think. We, we would um, go in and do about three or four days operating and then go back and replenish we had an enormous fleet train of um, Woolworth carriers and replacement aircraft and uh, repair ships and support ships. It was the biggest uh, fleet, of course, that I think has ever existed, that fleet uh, which comprised something like, if I recall rightly, four American groups. For the operations in support of Okinawan invasion and what subsequently followed mainland Japan, the closest the fleet went to the mainland was 200 miles. This was very much American policy for the range they ideally liked to launch their raids. So the ships were that distance out from the kamikaze airfields and the airfields that could be used by the Japanese Air Force had it remained uh, but it also was ideally suited to the aircraft they carried being a fleet operating in the Pacific all its aircraft had three and four times the endurance of aircraft that we were uh, employing in the European theatre the Spitfire and the Hurricane were designed as interceptors to go up, shoot at an enemy, knock it down, and come straight back down and land on. One R-30 sorties were regarded as perfectly adequate. To the Americans operating over the vast distances of the Pacific, they required and got three to six hour flights out of their naval aircraft flying from carriers. And the fact that we took an hour 
just to get to the shoreline when operating in the Sakashima Gunto in Japan uh, with the endurance of the Corsair of three and four hours with wide fuel margins we weren't in the least worried about it but some of the other carriers carried British aircraft Sea Fires and Fireflies both of which were practically thinking of time to go back by the time they got to the coastline having been launched 200 miles from from the mainland Japan uh, so we were very fortunate in operating American naval aircraft in the Okinawan campaign and subsequently against mainland Japan that is a very important point and we were very very lucky to get those aircraft very lucky indeed thanks to a particular naval officer of the fleet air arm uh, Dick Smeaton who when naval air attaché in Washington saw that these aircraft were proving a bit unpopular with the Americans who were that, by that time going largely for the Hellcat fighter he opted to buy the Corsair on his own slop chit without reference to their lordships and the treasury uh, in fact he ordered the first 200 of his own responsibility before getting it in, endorsed by their lordships and the go government of the day a very bold decision and one that um, was of immense value to the British Navy. How did you discover that? Well, I was around when he was doing it. Uh, I was his chief of staff. <laughs> That's another story. We had uh, four Corsairs in Lairs, 30,000, 20,000, 10,000 and 5,000 all patrolling that particular height and then we also had <coughs> a combat air control uh, uh, patrol over the islands at about um, 20,000 feet more or less out of range the anti-aircraft guns and the object of that was to prevent any enemy aircraft uh, landing or taking off uh, during times when the, the airfields were not actually being attacked so from dawn to dusk I used to take off at uh, before dawn somewhere about 5.30 a.m. and go on for about uh, seven, 7 in the evening continuously flying and as I say, keeping watch over these islands. Well, we were above him because um, we used to do patrols at a pretty high altitude, high for us. I mean, 20,000 feet air patrol was not nothing unusual. And that's where a Corsair was brilliant because it could get up there. It took a, a fair while, mind you, but it could get there. The sea fire. I think its operational um, uh, ceiling was about 14,000 or something. Even if it could get to 20,000 feet, it, took it, it, it had to come back again because it had used up all its fuel. And so they couldn't do uh, CAPs, which is called combat air patrols, except at low level, of which they were brilliant. But uh, most of ours were done at high altitude to get right above the, uh, any attack. And then we could see them, and they couldn't see us, probably. And, uh, it wasn't exactly a turkey shoot, mind you, as Americans would call it. <laughs> I remember shooting down a diner, I think called a diner, which was a twin engine, actually. Um, and uh, that was toddling along and didn't see us. We saw him, and we uh, attacked him, and uh, he didn't know what had happened, I don't think. And he went into the sea with great joy. <laughs> Hellcat was a, a remarkably fine aeroplane for ground attack work. Um, it was not only a very stable gun platform, an extremely tough aeroplane, um, very reliable. And uh, at this stage of the war, rockets which we were using as well were um, substantially more accurate than the 
those that were available in earlier days. And it was a good weapon for um, ground attack work. We also had uh, other targets other than uh, strictly aerodromes and uh, aircraft on the ground and so on. There were also a lot of uh, um, barges tied up in waterways which were uh, used for ferrying not only troops but um, tanks and, uh, and various um, transport. And these things were very heavily camouflaged, so not always easy to find. But um, they were certainly one of the targets which we had to look after as well. There weren't, in fact, that many um, fighters deployed against us. There were quite a number of kamikaze aircraft and long-range spotter-type aircraft, um, which were searching for the fleet in order to... Um, uh, established positions and, uh, for the suicide people. At that stage of the war, the, uh, the stuffing had really been knocked out of the Japanese Air Force. They, they were not uh, available, really able to uh, mount the degree of offensive air power against the fleet. But there was still um, a continuous danger from... Uh, kamikazes and um, the fleet uh, suffered this on a number of occasions. We did two days operations and then we withdrew about a hundred miles to refuel and while we were doing that uh, an American task, task force came in and did exactly the same job so that the um, uh, these airfields were continuously attacked every day for uh, about six weeks I think we were, we were there and it was a very intensive bombardment for example uh, I spotted for five cruisers uh, that were bombarding an airfield called Nabara. Uh, air raids were going in from all the carriers present, as hard as we could go, but the unfortunate thing was that a hole in the runway from a 500 pound bomb, which is what we were releasing and carrying, looked very impressive when we departed from it in daylight. But the next morning, when a few thousand coolies with wicker baskets on their shoulders, filled with soil and rocks, had dumped their contents in the crater, the runway was reasonably smooth and quite usable for the latter part of the night by Japanese transport aircraft. So in that respect, uh, it, it was a slightly uphill battle trying to keep these airfields out of operation, but they certainly were not operational in the daylight hours and for only an hour or two each night, it thereby reduced the Japanese effort in Okinawa considerably. over the island surveying all the airfields to see which ones were active and which ones weren't and and then I'd ring up the headquarters ship that was in Dom I'd say um, all the code names of the airfields which ones were working which ones were not which ones were still out you know that sort of thing whether there were any signs of activity so they planned their subsequent raids on these things and I used to go out and fly about twice a day in the morning and in the evening to see what was left and say well and I used to check up on the bombing raid and taking photographs of them I used to listen to the strike commander saying well we bombed that fair and square I said no you bloody didn't you missed and I've got a photograph to show it <laughs> you know I used to get them really snarled up they didn't like me very much uh, however we kept them we kept the airfields pretty quiet It was amazing to notice you could bomb the, the airfields and, and also gun positions, hit the runways, and you go back next morning 
and all the holes had been filled in and they were operating aeroplanes again and they were kept in dugouts underneath the ground somewhere and they'd bring them out and rush them off it was a <laughs> never ending task really we were several weeks later than the rest of the Pacific Fleet and so we were very annoyed that we weren't with them and in fact uh, the rest of the fleet started operations in March I think uh, but I think it was March the 26th according to that thing and we arrived uh, about the 14th of April so they'd already done two weeks operations toward, by the time we got up to the uh, islands in uh, Sakashima, Gante uh, Islands and we relieved the illustrious which had broken down and I remember the night the, the illustrious left one of the squadrons for Indomitable had uh, finished their, their tour of duty and, and were being relieved and they had going home in the illustrious and they had a big party on board and halfway through this party after, after many drinks uh, the seer of the squadron a chap called Tommy Harrington took me aside and he said uh, Biggie if you want to live never do more than run, one run on any target up here if you do two they'll get the bead on you and uh, that'll be the end of you and I took that advice uh, but the uh, seer of the other cor my other course I've got her on board that was 1842 uh, General Commander Judy Garland he was shot down the very first day doing exactly that taking two runs on the same the same target So we did Iceberg 1, we then went off and did Formosa. I suppose you knew we had a raid or two on Formosa because we thought that was the main supply route. But it was filthy weather down there. So I had fun shooting up a railway train and uh, one or two other things. That, uh, Successfully? Well, yes, all these raids had their sort of use, but no one, no, we didn't succeed uh, in admission. Uh, they thought that bigwigs thought he was exposing the fleet to, too much to go down there because if the Japanese had really got going uh, they might have done us a lot of mischief but there was nothing there to get going I think the Japanese were more or less spent by that time uh, they were concentrating on the home front rather than in Formosa or Taiwan as it is now so we went back to our little islands again The bombardment exercise was interesting because the, the big ships um, were firing 14-inch shells, uh, not only 14-inch but 6-inch as well, um, uh, all targeted at, the, at these runways. Um, so there was a lot of firepower. And then the next sadness is the we thought well a good idea of the battleships it'll be bombardment go these damn great guns and the 16 inch shells and all this damn silly things uh, so they said they'd do a bombardment well do you know what they bombarded the airfields with semi-armored piercing shells well uh, there they were doing a range of 16,000 yards which is what uh, uh, 12 miles I mean, quite a long way and they're, uh, they're, <laughs> they're coming straight down. This is what they should have done on the Bismarck. Stay out at range and have vertical descending shells. But semi-armor piercing, almost as bad as armor piercing, they go straight through the... They were all coral reef, these islands, you know. They did, and, and the size of a 15-inch of, of a shell, shall we say, it's about a foot or something like that. You make a lovely little hole. You go all the way down. You go down about 20 feet and go boom. 
and all it would do was blow a lot of stuff to the surface, so <laughs> make a hole in the, underneath a cavity. Well, didn't take depth very much time. <laughs> shovel in a few sh shovels of shit and fill up that hole. You really wanted a surface blast, you know, which made a great big crater. I remember um, where we were told to retreat or to retire from our positions off the coast uh, one evening. And what we used to do, we used to stay two days by the coast, so 25, 30 miles away to launch the attacks. And then we would nip back overnight and there was the fleet train waiting. And the fleet train consisted of of oilers, ammunition ships, vegetable ships, supply ships, bomb ships, all kinds of other merchantmen. And we would run, or they would come alongside us, and they'd replenish us with bombs, with aviation spirit, uh, with petrol, with uh, supplies of one sort or another, even mail. And um, very welcome it was too. And then after we'd done that all day, Overnight, we'd go back to where we'd been before and start another two days' operations. But after that, it was up off uh, Okinawa and just four days up and two days back and four days up and two days back. And this went on, I think it was the longest period that any British fleet had been at sea at that time. Remember that the, and I mean, I didn't realise as a young, uh, you know, sub lieutenant, what was I to know? Is how difficult it was for the for the admiral commanding that fleet because we had no logistic support. We we had never done replenishment at sea. We'd never done anything like that before, and so it was all brand new and and had to be uh, digested. We didn't have any ships that were really properly equipped for that kind of thing. But it was it was make and mend uh, as usual, and um, and it worked. I mean, and they did a fantastic job. Of course, they never got the credit I think for doing a fantastic job because um, the Americans were so much better organized and so so much larger in their the, the contingents they had there so it, it was um, it was never and of course by this time the war in England uh, in Europe was over and so people had forgotten the war and it was then known as the forgotten fleet out there in the, in uh, in the Pacific <laughs> 